Welcome to a new series titled Make Mine Marvel. I'm going to look back at some of the letters pages from the Marvel Age of Comics. I'll be reliving some of the opinions of the early fans and critics of this era. Recently, Make Mine Marvel has been reintroduced to help launch Marvel Legacy in September. Back in the 1960s, Make Mine Marvel was used by many fans as their signature sign-off in their letters to Stan, Jack and the gang. It was picked up by Marvel and first appeared in the special announcement section of the March-April issue of 1965. It might be most recognisable to many of you from the Merry Marvel Marching Society membership kit. Stan Lee injected an element of irreverent fun into his comics. And this was key to differentiating Marvel from its competitors. The combination of his witty dialogue and Marvel's dynamic artwork meant Marvel comic fandom grew quickly. Marvel were able to create a community of readers and for many lucky fans to have their letter printed in the comics was a badge of honour. Plus Stan in turn was able to learn what the readers liked and disliked. In 1960 letters pages were nothing new in comics with DC first publishing a letters column in Read Fact Comics 3 July to August 1946. DC's first regular feature began in Superman issue 124 in September 1958. In 1952, Stan trialed a letters page called Suspense Sanctuary in Suspense 21. This was followed briefly in War and Romance titles, but the experiment didn't catch on and was put on the back burner for another decade. He was inspired by the 1930s sci-fi pulps, as well as the letters pages in Leo Edwards' children's book entitled our chatterbox. Over at Entertaining Comics, Bill Gaines took a fresh approach to forming relationships with its readers through its fan organisation, the National EC Fan Addict Club. EC's recognition of artists in the 1950s was pioneering and in contrast to other comic book companies of the time. To quote Stan Lee, I sure did realise how important those letters pages were. They were another way, and one of the best ways, to relate to our readers and establish a friendly feeling between us. The guys at EC were the only ones who seemed to understand how important that sort of thing was. There were also economic reasons for having letter columns. In that era, to be considered a magazine and get lower postal rates, publications needed to have two full pages of text. That is why there were type stories in early comics. The letters pages eventually replaced those stories. The first Marvel letters page appeared in Fantastic Four issue 3. However, there is a similar letters page in Amazing Adult Fantasy 7. In the beginning, there were so few Fantastic Four letters that Stan wrote some himself and had Sol Brodsky, the production manager and colorist Stan Goldberg, add others. Even though in the important note just below the letters, it announced they were receiving so much mail, they couldn't read it all. Stan also printed the names and addresses of all the correspondents. Over at DC, their first letters page with full addresses appeared in The Brave and the Bold 35 in May 1961. Marvel weren't without their critics, and Stan could be quite humble when readers wrote in to correct mistakes they found in the comics. It is at this point where we will dive into the archives and look at one of Marvel's biggest critics, who eventually became their biggest fan. Gamacini was born in April 1949. He's worked in America and Britain for the past 40 years as a radio and TV presenter. He has a weekly show here in the UK called Pick of the Pops. He took an interest in comics from an early age, initially reading DC Comics and having his first letter published in Justice League of America. He even had a character introduced in The Flash, issue 141, named Paul Gamby, a tailor who specialised in making costumes for villains. He co-founded a comic book shop in London with fellow TV presenter and comic book fan and writer Jonathan Ross called Top 10 Comics. It opened its doors in Soho, London in 1989 and closed in 1995. Paul had his first letter to Marvel published in December 1962 in Fantastic Four issue 9 and he made his feelings very clear. Dear editor, I have tried to hold back for months but can't do it. My hatred of your mags has caused me to write. Your letters column is stupid, with asinine replies to only laudatory letters. Artwork is horrible. Your heroes are lily lily, with obvious faking of emotions. When you're dealing with human emotions, you have to be serious about it. The so-called heroes who act like real people, if so, I pity the human race, are fighting the greatest menace to mankind in each story. And they're too good to be realistic. Paul Gamacini, Westport, Connecticut. Stan replied by saying, Well, 
like Paul says. We only print the flattering letters, huh? So clearly Paul is not happy with the uh, Fantastic Four or even any of Marvel Comics at this point, comparing them to his maybe favourite comics uh, at DC, such as the Justice League or Flash. He also doesn't put his full address on the letter. So at this point, some of the Marvel fans are communicating because they're published the address, so they're creating a kind of small community. And clearly, as someone who doesn't like the comics, he doesn't want to get any hate mail. Only a few months later, Paul started to change his tune. He was clearly reading a lot of other Marvel issues. As you can see in this next letter in Fantastic Four 13, cover dated April 1963. Dear Editor, Fantastic Four has greatly improved, but that's no reason it shouldn't be improved more. The cover of 10 is the best yet, and I have a feeling that you used one of those techniques to get it that way. Return of Doctor Doom was very good, but keep him away now, he's gone. He is an awful villain. I'm glad you're lengthening the letter page. Good for you. However, this Dear Stan and Jack stuff doesn't seem right. Not respectful enough. I mean, who would walk up to somebody and say, Hiya Kirby, or How you doing Stan, when you've never met them before? Anyway, here are my suggestions. We've only got room to print some, Stan and Jack. 1. Give the Human Torch his own comic. He's great. No doubt about it. Sure, I know we get him monthly in Strange Tales, but that's not enough. 2. Please eliminate those thick borderlines of the word balloons. They are hideous. 3. Please eliminate those five-page stories in your comics. Either make them one tale or devote the space to Thor, Ant-Man, etc. You see, I don't buy Journey into Mystery or Tales to Astonish because of these little stories. 4. None of these giant anteaters from Guafa or insect kings from Zorda, okay? 5. Give Submariner his own magazine. 6. Please eliminate those pin-up pages and text stories. They waste space. 7. Please don't print many of those silly boo-boo letters. 8. Let's have more human foes like Submariner and Pace Pot Pete. 9. How about individual comics from Ant-Man and Thor? P.S. From those poses in FF10, you'd think the faces of Lee and Kirby are as bad as Doctor Doom's. How about letting us see them, even if it is torture? Paul Gambaccini, 8 Elizabeth Drive, Westport, Connecticut. Stan replied with, After the way you pick on our stories, which we think are great, we'd be afraid to show you our faces, which are probably not so great. Now clearly what's key here is, we know the timeline of what changed in the Marvel comics. So some of the points that Paul picked up on were implemented, like the, the coloured lines around the word balloons, uh, giving Ant-Man uh, his own kind of half comic, giving Thor his entire comic, and slowly these smaller five-page monster and suspense stories were phased out. I should also add that in Fantastic Four 10, I should also add at this point in Fantastic Four 10, Stan eliminates the dear editor and more going for a Dear Stan and Jack, a more open and friendly approach. In August 1963, in Fantastic Four 17, Paul is pretty much won over. Dear Stan and Jack, my resistance is useless. The Fantastic Four versus the Red Ghost and his indescribable super apes, phew, is the best comic book story ever printed. For plot, characters and parody, it cannot be topped. I would serve you fellows breakfast in bed, but your eating time is probably spent in making a great story for the next issue of Fantastic Four. Seriously, Fantastic Four 13 was so good I nearly died from the prospects of having to wait for 14. The reasons are thusly. The cover was the best to come out of your company yet, however I do have a few suggestions. First of all, the logo is bad, makes it look like a humid comic. Secondly, there's too much sensationalism and such stuff taking up space. In this spellbinding tale, you will meet the most dramatic being. Who cares? Who is he? Since you've already given us the name, I can be pretty assured that the name is the Watcher. Surprisingly enough, he is the most dramatic being of all time. Two, art was amazing. Ditko's inking of Kirby's pencils are better than Ayer's on FF. The other way round on Hulk. JK's version of Torch was Gracias a Dios, improved tremendously since the first few pathetic issues. Three, outrageous parody. That panel where Mr. Fantastic made his sermon on the Reds and the Americans both being Earthmen. This is wrong. Why can't we leave our differences behind us? We should be making this trip together. Would have had me rolling in the chair, but the fact that I was at the barbers at the time, I read it. Four, 
tremendous plot action. To thee, Stan Lee, all I can do is offer my greatest thanks. Five, Invisible Girl finally did something. Well, there were so many great things about the story that I can't list them all. All I can do is tell you that I bought two copies and since 12 have subscribed to what is truly the world's greatest comic magazine. Get me the smelling salts, Jack. I feel faint. Are you kidding, Stan? I'm too shocked to move. Next, I have several hundred comics to make on FF14, so I dig right in. First of all, congratulations on your new symbol. It's far more decorative than the cryptic MC, which once hid in the farthest corner of the covers. I'm glad you reduced the logo, as it's one of the worst in the comics history, making the FF sound like a humor mag, although it is the world's greatest comic magazine. Kirby's art is getting much better. The story of the merciless puppet master was badly named, as usual, but this didn't reflect the quality of the story. Puppet Master is one of your worst creations, but with Samariner, he manages to become halfway decent. Nevertheless, I hope he doesn't escape from the digestive system of a giant octopus. Speaking of Submariner, I now recommend that he remains a villain. He's better this way than ever possible he could be as a hero. I just love those side incidents in FF, and 14 didn't disappoint. I nearly flipped from those scenes at the airport and SM's Undersea Sanctum. The parody and conflict in FF is wonderful. Keep it up. Not that you had any thoughts of discontinuing them, I hope. And you're going to introduce an FF annual? Good heavens, I hope this isn't the kind of grubby reprints that other companies are printing. If it's made of reprints, prepare to lose money. Stan adds that it isn't. Finally, I'd like to compliment you on the excellence of Iron Man. I've raved before and I'll rave again. Iron Man is better than his predecessor, as well as three quarters of the mush that cavorts through what is commonly called a comic magazine. Naturally, I'm not talking about FF. I hope these episodes don't bore you and I feel compelled to talk whenever I read an FF. And once I've started talking, nobody stops me. So you finally converted me. Stan replies by saying, Glad we've converted you, PG. But now that we've got you, what do we do with you? So this is a much longer letter that covers two issues, issue 13 and 14. Uh, he still has his criticisms, uh, but is now bringing up other comics such as Iron Man. He clearly wasn't a fan of the shorter stories uh, in the kind of pre-hero Marvel issues. He also likes the new kind of corner image of each title. So Ditko introduced this with Spider-Man and Fantastic Four to differentiate between the uh, the Marvel comics on the, the newsstand. A few issues later in Fantastic Four 20, Paul is referred to in another fan's letter, a little known at the time, George R.R. R. Martin, writer of Game of Thrones. He wrote in to say, Dear Stan and Jack, FF17 was greater than great. Even now I sit in awe of it, trying to do the impossible. That is, describe it. It was absolutely stupendous. I could not fathom how you could fit so much action into so few pages. It will live forever as one of the greatest FF comics ever printed, ergo as one of the greatest of all comics. In what other comic mag would you see things like a hero falling down a manhole, a heroine mistaking a toy inventor for a criminal, and the president of the USA leaving a conference that may determine the fate of the world to put his daughter to bed? The epic story, spectacular and exciting as it is, is not all that made this mag so great. The letter column was top-notch too. I nearly died when I saw Paul Gambaccini's letter. You've really made him change his tune. That letter was a far cry from one printed in FF9. Then there's your cover boast, the world's greatest comic magazine. Brilliant. You were just about the world's worst mag when you started, but you set yourself an ideal and by gumbo you achieved it. More than achieved it. In fact, why, if you were only half as good as you are now, you'd still be the world's best mag. George R. Martin, 35 East 1st Street, Bayonne, New Jersey. Stan replied by saying, we might as well quit while we're ahead. Thanks for your kind words, George. And now it's time for our favorite department where we talk to you straight from the shoulder. George had obviously seen the development of Paul's uh, attitude change and um, by Stan printing this, it obviously changed some opinions of others. As George said, the magazines were rubbish to begin with. This was clearly key to Marvel growing its readership uh, and creating a community of fans 
uh, that were able to connect with each other and develop comic fandom. Paul then took to a different title in December 1963, and that was Amazing Spider-Man, issue 7. He wrote, Dear Stan and Steve, may I congratulate you, or should it be thank you, for the tremendous quality of Amazing Spider-Man. Originally, meaning Amazing Fantasy 15, he was a run-of-the-mill deadbeat, typical of the Baleford boredom which sometimes prevailed in your comics. The Ditko art, pitifully primitive, and made one believe that Steve was a doting, senile old codger who you kept on your staff because you didn't have the heart to fire him. But no longer! The plots now ring with originality, and the villains are as vibrant as life. And Ditko! Now I picture him as a lively, eager 25-year-old. His Spider-Man is one of the best heroes today. No longer does Steve have the same old faces in each story, gazing towards the rest of an empty panel. He's helped most of all to bring the amazing Spider-Man right up to the top of the Marvel Comics group. Some people now put him over the fabulous Fantastic Four, folks in fandom that is, and the brilliant Sergeant Fury. And it's not the same old Stan Lee either, who claims of, we're superior, we're different, we're the best, we're too great for words, we're trying to promote his own work, sort of like most of your competitors. I don't know if their stuff has deteriorated or whether you have improved that much, but the competition now seems like, ugh. Each person in the plot is a complete world, down to the bow tie and personality. Wow, now that I've cleared my head, I know what I should have said at the beginning. May I thank you for the tremendous quality of Amazing Spider-Man. Paul Gambaccini, 8 Elizabeth Drive, Westport, Connecticut. Stan, with a longer reply this time, said, We appreciate your praise, Paul, but feel we must pause for a serious word to you and all of fandom. We don't feel it's fair for you to knock any other group of magazines while boasting ours. After all, it's just a matter of taste, and there are probably many fans who prefer our competitors' mags to ours. There are many fine talents producing well-written and well-drawn stories at other houses beside Marvel. While we admit we try to create the greatest comics possible, we feel it isn't proper to comment about mags other than our own on these pages. Okay? The reply from Stan is very kind of peculiar. It's serious in a way, but I'm trying to work out if it really is. Um, the fact that Paul mentions in there that the competitors are now ich, and he doesn't even read them suggests that he now is only reading Marvel. And by saying ich, uh, I think Paul um, has quoted saying that Stan took that idea and used it for not brand ich. Um, down the line. Whether or not that, that is the case, I don't know. Paul then writes another letter in Fantastic Four 24, March 1964. He writes, Dear Stan and Jack, in future years you may be known as the men with the guts of steel. That's what it takes to present such a story as you did in Fantastic Four 21. You really took chances. I shudder to think what it would have been like if it had bombed. Fortunately, it wasn't a bomb and everything turned out great. You are to be saluted. Haven't seen Sergeant Fury 4 yet, so we'll comment later, but I always considered it a brilliant satire, until a lunkhead told me it was supposed to be serious. Okay, one nut I can take. Now my brother tells me it's supposed to be serious. Stan, please, tell me it's a parody before I go out of my mind. Stan replies by saying, A parody of what, Paul? War itself is insane, senseless. How do you parody something which is like a mad nightmare to begin with? And by the way, speaking of guts, wait till you see the theme we choose for Sgt. Fury 6 on sale Jan 3rd. We predict it'll be one of our most controversial mags of the year. In Paul's final letter that I could find, um, cover dated October 1964 in Sgt. Fury 11, he writes, Dear Stan and Dick, Sgt. Fury does not dwell in overworked trivialities. Fury is light, playful and humorous and exciting. When he does get serious, it isn't that bad. The main point of all this idiocy is, so what if Dr. Zemo is a fantastic far-fetched foe? He's entertaining and more power to him and you. His dual appearances in July issues have been very clearly handled. What a tie-in. I never dreamed you'd be able to provide a roadway joining your comics and war heroes of the 40s to your efforts of today. But you've succeeded admirably. Avengers 6 was simply spectacular. More please. Art-wise, Dick Ayer's Fury was surprisingly great. I've decided the best way to handle him is to let him ink his own pencils. Let him keep this book. His version is superior to Kirby Bell's. As for Kirby Stone, you've come up with what is by far the finest team in Marveldom. 
in the past year or two. His mastery of the human form is fantastic. Over 30 people in just one panel, and probably at least 200 in one story. Great. Paul Gambaccini, 8 Elizabeth Drive, Westport, Connecticut. Stan replied by saying, When Paul used to criticise us, we'd sit back and say, Ah, oh, what does he know? But now we seem to have won him over, and we can't help but admire his good taste and critical ability. So this brings me to the end of Paul's letters. I couldn't find any more, and... Stan kind of rounds it up there. Clearly they they had an affection with Paul and his criticisms, many of which they took on board. At this point, Marvel were probably receiving more and more letters, and at their peak they were getting 30,000 a month. So it became harder to reply or even find certain uh, readers to publish. What is clear from looking at Paul's letters is that the fans had an influence over the direction of Marvel Comics. Their criticisms and their praise kind of help Stan choose the direction in which the comics should go. Even to the extent of saying what inkers work best with what artists. For example, Dick Ayers did go on to pencil the issues of Sgt. Fury for over a decade. I hope to produce more videos like this looking at the early moments of the Marvel Age of Comics. Uh, as well as producing a fortnightly video that looks at the Marvel chronology. Uh, starting with Fantastic Four 1. Do share this with other comic book collectors and lovers of comic history. And don't forget to subscribe to see more content like this in the future. Uh, in the meantime, take care of yourselves.